There. Is that working? Yes. Yes, it is. Oh, okay. I had you in... I had myself camera controlled. Okay. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yikes. All right, so hi, everyone. Uh, so this is going to be episode of Astronomy Cast 320. But what's really cool is I'm down at the YouTube creator space in Los Angeles. So I'm in the green room. You've become a Hollywood celebrity. Let's be yeah, real. Yeah, a minor Hollywood celebrity. <laughs> you're an <laughs> Very official minor. listener? A D-list, yeah, D-list. I said E. -list. I think, I think you're, e? you're yeah. still one. We, we haven't made a red carpet yet. No, no. I think if we cross 20,000 YouTube subscribers, then it gets serious. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's great. They've got this amazing space down in L.A., and if you have more than 10,000 subscribers on YouTube, you can come down here and you can use their camera gear and their audio gear, and they've got these really cool, um, like, studios that we can use. And so we've got one booked for a couple of days, and we're going to do a bunch of interviews and use that to enhance the videos that we're doing on the on the Universe Today channel. So it's, so it's great. You should, come, you should come by and check it out. But thanks. YouTube and Google for letting us be able to use this space. And hopefully you'll see all the cool stuff we're going to do with it. How's it going there? It's soybean season, so so I think this episode may best be subtitled and Pamela sniffles into her microphone. All right, well, I, I'm sure Preston will be able to hack that all out. It'll yeah, just and sound... poor Richard as he does the, the yeah. It's, <laughs> our entire editorial staff will hate my guts. No, no. <laughs> no it's the time, we're all used to it, it's the when, when the soybeans get harvested and Pamela gets the snifflies. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So uh, if you've never done this before, we're going to do a 30-minute episode of Astronomy Cast. Today it's going to be episode 320, which is Layers of the Sun. Uh, and then we'll stick around for a few minutes and uh, answer some questions that people might have about the uh, terrifying ball of plasma <laughs> just a few uh, hundred million kilometers away from us. 100 million kilometers away from us. Um, <laughs> so great. Let's uh, let's get rolling. Are you ready to record there? I I think so. Do you want me to press record? I I think I want that. I I, I think I can can fulfill that want. I I'm pressing record. I have also pressed record. Okay, cool. And now I've got to find some windows. All right, here we go. We are good. You good? Okay, here we go. Yeah. Astronomy Cast, episode 320, Layers of the Sun. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor... A professor? That's where you fucking cash. All right. Can I try this whole thing again? Here yes. we go. Right. Uh, I'm going to restart the recording, and you should do the same. Oh, so there's it. no okay. permanent record of me of making a mistake. Of you being unable to say professor? It's a little thirsty. It's, oh, great. Uh, Jay, my, uh, my, the cameraman on the uh, videos we've been doing, he's, uh, he's getting this. So he's, he's got it recorded. So we've got it. Okay. I have an attic. You have a professional studio. Okay. Yeah, there I'm, you go. I'm pressing record and pouting. Okay, here we go. I have also pressed record. We are recording. Get a little water first. <laughs> are we going to restart again? <laughs> professor, professor, professor. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restart again. Dang it. Okay. All right. Going then back. We... Take okay. three. Take three. No, let's just take one. <laughs> All right, you ready? Okay. Yep, pressing record. It's recording. I've also, I've also pressed record. All right. Astronomy Cast, episode 320, Layers of the Sun. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing really well. So this is a, ve a very special episode of Astronomy Cast. I feel like every episode is a very special episode, but this is a very special episode of Astronomy Cast that we are actually recording live as a Google Plus Hangout from the YouTube studio and in my Los attic. Angeles. The YouTube, yeah, the YouTube creator space in Los Angeles and Pamela's uh, attic in uh, in Southern Illinois. So, uh, and you can all uh, sort of watch along as we use it. So we're actually in a green room at the uh, creator space. 
and uh, and hopefully you'll be able to see a little bit of behind the scenes when we uh, we'll post some more videos later on. Uh, so, uh, what's happening there? Uh, well, I think the most exciting thing is it's harvest season, which means the leaves are yellow and the pollen levels are high, but the apple cider is is in large amounts. So I've got a couple of quick announcements. One announcement is that uh, for those who watched, we did a, vi a special episode of the Weekly Space Hangout just on Friday to talk about Comet Ison. This is actually a collaboration with the Discovery Channel, uh, Discovery Channel Canada, and the Discovery Science Channel out of the United States. And they're going to be doing, they're going to be broadcasting a special about Ison on December fourth. Uh, 2013, and so uh, if you get a chance to watch it, I'm in it, Pamela's in it, and uh, and sort of one of our hangouts is in it, and it should be a lot of fun. So yeah, keep Nicole an eye out for that. Joined us, Nicole Gallucci and David Dickinson. Yeah, it's uh, it was it was a really good time. Um, the next thing is that there is uh, an upcoming uh, from the National Science Foundation. They're doing a Comet Ison contest, and I just wanted to give them a uh, a shout out. So do a search for that. We'll put some we'll put some links in the show notes so you can see that. But if you can take some pictures of Comet Ison and get them to the National Science Foundation, uh, they've got uh, prizes. So this is going to be great. I know that was very really short on details. So check our show. <laughs> do a search. Comet Ison Contest National Science Foundation. And uh, and you could win $2,500. Um, okay. Here we go on the topic for today. Uh, so our sun isn't just a terrifying ball of white-hot plasma. It's actually a lot more complex. It's got layers. And today, we're going to peel back those layers and learn more about the sun from the inside out. Um, now, Pamela, we've talked about the sun in the past. Uh, it's a, As I said, it's a terrifying ball of plasma just located a mere uh, 140 million, 149 million kilometers away from us. Uh, so what should we know about the sun? Um, it's a terrifying giant ball of plasma. Yeah, that really is all we need to know. <laughs> uh, but for the, for the, for the, it's, it's actually pretty funny. So like I said, Jason, Jason Harmer, the guy who I do the uh, uh, do these videos with, whenever we do episodes on the sun, he turns to me and goes, does it ever freak you out, the fact that we've got this gigantic ball of plasma that's only a few tens of millions of kilometers away. Isn't that kind of scary? It's it, not it's scary. It's basically 150 million kilometers if you do yeah. the rounding correctly. So it's not quite as bad as you're letting on. We, we can yeah. add a... It's far enough million. away. And in fact, you know, <laughs> without the sun, we wouldn't have any We'd life at all. Yes. So, so thank you, sun. We, we appreciate everything you've ever done for us. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, you know, and when we see, we imagine the sun, we just imagine this great big ball of just you know, roiling plasma. But in fact, if we sort of peel back these layers, it's what's worse inside? than that. It's, um, wor it's, it's worse than that. <laughs> so let's let's kind of let's as I mentioned, let's start from the inside out. Um, and so, like, what if we were to get right down to the very heart of the sun? What would, so, what would we find? So, if, if we go all the way down to the solar core, where where the juicy stuff is happening, we we'd be able to. Um, experience firsthand as our body is completely disintegrate, disintegrated and becomes nothing except for a plasma of atoms, uh, we'd be able to experience densities of 160 grams per cubic centimeter, which is kind of a lot for a cubic centimeter. Um, in fact, it's 10 times denser than lead. And at this density and at the temperature of the heart of the sun, which is 15 million degrees Kelvin, which is 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, um, at those temperatures, it's possible for nuclear reactions to occur. It's possible for uh, neutrons and protons to come together to form uh, heavy nuclei of hydrogen that collide together, eventually leading to helium, working their way up. Um, we have a good proton-proton chain going, and all of these things lead to vast amounts of gamma rays and neutrinos being released. And it's—I it's, was just going to say—it's kind of amazing that you've got at the very center of the sun this this environment that is denser than lead, because I don't think that's sort of what you would imagine. That you would imagine, you know, the very core of the sun. Like you imagine this like intense heat and intense pressure, but in fact. 
yeah, it's as dense as as lead. And and I think this is one of those things where I've just been studying astronomy so long that the that I actually came at it from the exact opposite. It's only ten times denser than lead. That seems not that dense at all. Because I think white dwarfs, it's like a tablespoon is is the weight of an elephant. Right. Neutron <laughs> star, right? The weight of a mountain. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. And so here we have a tablespoonful that's only 160 grams. Um, but yeah, it it takes intense pressures, intense energies in in order to get the sort of nuclear fusion taking place. And one of the reasons that we can't readily get sustainable fusion here on Earth is, well, the sun has gravity to create this amazing pressure and the ideal gas law and other gas laws to happily provide the high temperatures that comes out of taking a large ball of mass and crushing it with gravity. And and it's this combination of pressure from the gravity and temperature from just the way materials work that drives these nuclear reactions. And the amount of energy that it takes to artificially create that sort of temperature energy combination is is something that we just can't generate here on Earth so that the amount of energy you get out of the reaction is greater than the amount of energy you put into the reaction. Right, right. And so how big is this region of the sun? How much of the sun is this, this the core? It, it's only the inner few percentage of, of, of the core, so it's, or of the sun. The vast bulk of the sun actually goes into regions that uh, radiatively tra transfer this energy to the surface, that convectively transfer this energy to the surface. Um, the, the inner section, it's, it's not a lot of the sun that's able to achieve the needed pressures and densities for um, all that vast, nasty amount of convection, uh, nas nasty amount of fusion to be taking place. Right, and I think again, that's something that a lot of people are quite surprised about: the fact that that the part of the sun that's actually generating the energy is really just this this few percent. That the rest of the sun doesn't have this density and pressure and heat required to to allow this fusion to take place. And and to give you a scale of the size of the sun, because again, this is one of those things that people I think really struggle with. Um, the sun's basically seven hundred thousand kilometers in radius. Uh, so we're looking at a couple of times the Earth Moon diameter when you start looking at the or Earth Moon distance when you start looking at the size of the sun. Um, but the Earth is still awful small. Those sunspots that you see on the sun, those sunspots are the size of the Earth in many cases. Right. Okay, so I think we've got a pretty good idea at the core. We've got these intense pressures, intense temperatures. We've got this proton-proton fusion reaction that's creating gamma rays. And I think one of, the, one of those amazing stories is how those gamma rays have to get from there to the surface. But... And yeah, and how they actually transfer in what they are. It's not like the Earth is getting bombarded with pure gamma rays coming at us from the sun. Um, if that were the case, we would again probably be dead. Um, but, so that leads us to the next layer of the sun. Yes. So so beyond that layer, and, and the way the sun works, and, and Chandrasekhar is, is one of the scientists who worked really hard to figure this out. Before that, people had been looking at at all sorts of different matters and Eddington came forward and was like no no no, no. it's nuclear reactions guys um, not coals not chemistry not any normal chemical reaction we've we've got fusion and then Chandrasekhar wrote a really awesome small book on stellar atmospheres that details all of the math in a beautifully straightforward way and I highly recommend trying to find this old penguin book at a used book sale used bookstore if you can um, and the way it works is as you move outward from the center of the Sun there's clearly less stuff pushing down on you so the density decreases as you move from the center of the Sun out towards the edges, but at the same time that the density is decreasing, the temperature is also decreasing until physics breaks when you get to the outer 
most layers of the sun, which we'll get to. So as you move outwards, you eventually reach this point where it's no longer dense enough and it's no longer hot enough for these fusion reactions to continue. And at that point, you end up with a level of radiation transfer taking place, an envelope of radiation transfer. And in this area, the, the light that's passing out, those gamma rays, those high energy photons, as they pass out, they're getting absorbed and readmitted and absorbed and readmitted over and over and over again by all the material that is still extremely dense. It's still extremely opaque. And each time one of these poor innocent photons of deadly energy levels gets re-emitted, um, it, it is going to excite an electron often to the point of escape. But the electron doesn't stay at that high energy level. And if it's a free electron that absorbs the photon, it doesn't stay at that high energy level. And those extremely energetic electrons, they end up releasing energy in lower energy photons. So one gamma ray absorption might lead to, well, over the course of time, a thousand lower energy photons being given off. And it's these lower energy photons that then move out, get reabsorbed, move out, get reabsorbed. And, and this just goes on and on and on. And it, um, depending on whose paper you read, uh, takes anywhere from 17,000 to a million years for that photon to escape. And more realistically, it probably takes order of 40,000 years for a produced gamma ray photon to end up becoming a thousand lower energy photons that finally escape the sun. So, I mean, I imagine like with the density of the material in this radiative zone, the journey that these photons have to take from the one particle to the next one is really short. I mean, it's literally nanometers to then to get reabsorbed. I mean, you can't go very far, right? But it's, it's also a completely random walk. So, photon might start out heading straight towards the surface, but then it gets absorbed and gets re sent out on its journey in a completely random direction. So it might head towards the surface, head towards the center, head to the left, head to the right, head in any possible direction and and in three-dimensional space there's a whole lot of directions to choose from. Right, but just imagine that, right? Like if you had one of these photons and you just let it go in one direction, it would go for a million years or a hundred thousand years, let's say a hundred thousand years, right? It would be a hundred thousand light years away. It would have essentially yes. crossed the entire galaxy if some if it was allowed to just go in a straight line. But because it's having to do this completely random walk, and it might get almost to the surface or almost out of the radiative zone and then get turned around and go back the other way and just bounce around inside until it finally randomly makes it outside of the radiative zone. And and this is called Brownian motion or uh, drunk walking. Brownian motion is a much more politically um, correct term. Yeah. And yeah, it's a completely random path that luckily on average uh, leads to the photon getting to escape the sun. And, and as it continues to go, it, it eventually reaches the point where the, the amount of time that it takes for each of these progressively lower and lower energy photons to get emitted um, gets longer. And this sounds like, okay, yeah, and, well, when, when an atom's holding on or an electron is holding on to that higher energy photon, it's at a higher energy state. And that's another way of saying that sucker's hotter. And in a gas, which is what our sun is, it's another way of looking at hot ball of deadly plasma, um, our, our gaseous sun, it becomes a lava lamp at a certain point because these atoms, they're holding on to that, that higher energy. They're staying hot. And you'll end up with a blob of this hotter gas, this lower density gas, and lower density material floats. And if it holds on to the heat long enough, that blob is going to end up rising to a cooler region, radiative transfer, then giving off its heat to its surroundings and sinking back down. Right. So you end up with this zone where, because the radiative process isn't happening fast enough, 
you instead end up with a convective process. And that's the next region of the sun, the convective envelope. Nice seg segue. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you've got the core, outside of that is this radiative zone, right? And it's almost like, when you think about it, it's like each zone is this transition between what just isn't possible anymore. Right. right? When I think about the radiative zone, it's it really begins where the the core, where you just can't fuse hydrogen anymore, and then you've got to do something different, yes. right? And then you get to this point where, where it's almost like it's the opposite, with where the convection will, will actually function. Like below that, you just convection isn't going to work, and that's why you have this radiative zone in between. So, what are we seeing inside the convective zone? Uh, in the convective zone, you you actually have blobs of hotter material rising and blobs of cooler material sinking, and and we can actually start to see this when we look at the sun in the correct filters and with high enough resolution. You see these solar granules boiling on the surface. These are the convective bubbles. Uh, in terms of chemistry um, and gas laws and thermal dynamics, this is very similar to what happens when you have hot oil on your stove and you start to see these cells of, of material rising and sinking in your oil on the stove. Our sun is doing very similar things that you can see when you start looking at it high resolution in H alpha filters. This is something that amateurs have really gotten good at bringing out in the last few years. Like, have yes. you really seen that? You know, with the <clears throat> with the kind of astrophotography that people are doing, and the kinds of these HR filters, you can really see the just the these great granules on the surface where these bubbles of plasma are rising to the surface and you know it feels like they're popping and then you yeah. know the material sinking back down and and it's actually a very beautiful process and um just the way you described it actually describes how we write the software to start understanding the centers of stars, how we understand why big stars act differently from little stars we write models that say you have a star with this radius, with this mass, with this density calculated at each layer and as you calculate the densities you get to the temperatures and vice versa. Uh, it's multiple equations you all have to solve together and when we write the software and we step through the different layers we see what physics is allowed and what physics isn't and how the energy is transferred and we balance the equations until we balance a star and it's it's the type of project that's just within reach of an undergraduate astronomy student and is the standard homework assignment of the graduate student uh, but to do it fully in three dimensions starts to become a lifetime career yeah you've described this as the hardest science you know of well, it, it's because you have to start dealing with magnetospheres. This is where you get into magnetohydrodynamics. You have to deal with mass loss, with cool stars. You have to deal with dust formation. Uh, it's a complicated process that requires physics and chemistry and nuclear physics all getting balanced one against the other. And I think, you know... As the stars, and we've talked about dwarf stars and other kinds of stars, and I don't want to sort of go into too deeply on this episode, but but I think as a star gets bigger, the those zones change, and the same thing is as a star gets smaller, right? Right, and and in fact, in some cases, you can actually get um, a, con a fully convective star. This is one of the really neat things about the smallest red dwarf stars that are still stars. So they have a fully convective envelope. They never have sufficient nuclear burning that you end up with that radiative zone and because they're fully convective they end up burning the entirety of the composition of the star um, through the nuclear processes and a star like the Sun uh, for the most part atoms that are in the outer layer of the envelope they're happy to stay there and so they're not going to end up being part of the nuclear burning that goes on in the center right and so it's like in with our Sun we've got that radiative layer is like a firewall that stops the convective material from getting down and mixing in the core. So you'd and love to have that, you know, because then you the sun would last for trillions of years, but it can't. 
and and so instead what we see is with the material that's down in the core at a certain point you're going to run out of the hydrogen and when that happens the star is initially going to crush down because you don't have the light pressure pushing outwards supporting the outer layers and as it starts to crush down you're going to end up with a shell around that core uh, flashing into to heal into hydrogen burning eventually you're going to end up with helium burning in the core not necessarily in that order um, it's it's a dynamic process where you're constantly rebalancing these equations and looking to see well at this temperature and density what nuclear possibilities exist and then looking at the amount of light that's giving off measuring how much light pressure in the equations is predicted, figuring out how that balances out against the energy being released. You're constantly, well, dealing with light pressure out, gravitational pressure in, density, temperature, and that mass, which doesn't bother to stay constant because you have mass loss going on throughout the lifetime of the star. Um, so then we've got the sort of the three major internal layers of the sun. Yes. So then we've got the surface. Well, and, and the surface is one of the most annoying parts of the sun. Uh, at, at the top, you have the photosphere. This is that nice 6,000 Kelvin degree surface that, that we see when we look at the sun. Um, my brain is, is happy to, to consider this a nice, cool temperature because I've been doing astronomy for far too long. And, and this photosphere is when you use a white light filter to look at the sun, that's that area that you're looking at that contains the even cooler sunspots that are earth-sized and indicate the places where you have magnetic fields uh, looping through the surface, creating their differently polarized spots on the surface. So we've got the photosphere. This is where we see the, the color, the photons that have finally yes. been able to escape out into space and this is what they look like the final and, result of it and then the Sun gets confusing everything that we've done up until this point is easy to simplify and explain at a level that you can get an undergraduate to write computer software for um, everything above that um, it, it's, weird. it's yeah so so for reasons that we don't know um, although there's usually a new paper every double AS that gets a big press release um, the chromosphere starts to get hotter at 7000 degrees Kelvin and as you go even further out to the corona which is that beautiful um, gas flowing out to space bit that you see during a solar eclipse and that every little kid draws when they draw the Sun that that corona is not a cool refreshing beverage it's actually a three million Kelvin plasma that right. is deadly so we're into the atmosphere now of the Sun so we've got that that the surface and then as we move up is the corona kind of that first layer of the atmosphere no that would make more sense the the photosphere is the first layer. right and we've talked about the photosphere right which right. Is, which is the surface so above that is the chromosphere, which is the about 7,000 degrees Kelvin. And so uh, what, disting what distinguishes the chromosphere? It, it's you start to get a transition in just how dense things are. Um, as you go to lower and lower densities, the photosphere is kind of that nice contiguous band of red glowy stuff uh, above the granulations that you see with H-alpha. Um, and then above that is is the chromosphere and then above that is the cro corona which is where you see the coronal mass ejections where you see the um, coronal loops and all of those bits of, of gas that are streaming in all directions and you said that the corona is hotter than the surface of the Sun by a, like yes. a long shot yeah yeah it sort of goes from 6,000 Kelvin to three million and and reasons for this goes to uh, the energy being released when the magnetic field lines break and rearrange themselves um, to pie in the sky ideas and it's it's no one's completely certain why um, but it has to do with somehow energy is getting released at this high level
Yeah, I've I've heard there's like waves moving through the through the corona and could be releasing energy that way. Or yeah, got... they talk about acoustic waves colliding, um, all sorts of different things. Now, now for better or worse, at least this is an extraordinarily low density environment. So if you were to take the Starship Enterprise and fly it into the corona, uh, because it's so low density. Um, the energy transfer isn't particularly effective and you're not going to get um, a lot of transfer to your ship's hull. So it will kill you eventually, just not quickly. Right. It's not the same as you attempting to fly your spaceship through the core of the sun where you've got the... You just the, die. Yeah, you've got the pressure <laughs> and the temperature. In this case, you've just got the temperature. Yeah. You don't have the pressure. Okay, so we've got the corona. Is there anything outside of the corona? That that's pretty much it. I mean, what we do pay attention to is well, you wouldn't necessarily call it a layer of the sun. You have the solar wind, which is streaming material throughout our entire solar system, pushing out, um, defining where the boundary of our solar system is. You have coronal mass ejections, which periodically fling large bursts of material toward the planet Earth. Um, and other points in the solar system, to be fair. Uh, so those are the layers of the sun, but that doesn't mean that the sun keeps its hands to itself. It does like to wreak havoc on the rest of the solar system and push out to define our boundaries and the boundaries between us, us and interstellar space. Yeah, I guess you could sort of imagine the the heliosphere as like the outer the outer layer of the sun. Right, the yeah. point at which the the solar wind hits the cosmic wind and the the interstellar wind, and they kind of balance each other out. That's really the end of the influence of the of the material streaming off the sun, but not necessarily its gravity. Right. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Fraser. Now I need to do one more thing. So Preston, if you're still listening, I kind of messed up the uh, the promotion of the Comet Ison photo contest, and I've gotten better information. So I'm going to sort of take another crack at it. So, um, uh, so the second thing that I want to promote is that we're doing a photo contest on Comet Ison, and so this is a promotion that's being done with Universe Today and Space Weather and OPT Telescopes. I know you're good friends with the folks at OPT Telescopes, Pamela. Yeah, they're great. Great people. And uh, so the way this is going to work is that we want you to capture your best images of Comet Ison and then enter daily for prizes. And, you know, OPT is giving out more than $10,000 worth of equipment and telescopes and amazing gear uh, from lots of different prize donors. Celestron, uh, Explore Scientific, Takahashi, Vixen. It's pretty great. So uh, what you'll want to do, we've got a post on Universe Today and we'll put it into the show notes. Or you want to go to Space Weather or you want to go to OPT Telescopes and look for the Comet Ison Photo Contest and you can enter this. Uh, the contest began on November 1st and it ends on December 31st, 2013 and the winners will be announced on, on January 7th. So lots of time. So take some great pictures of Comet Ison. Uh, post them and uh, and get a chance to win some amazing prizes. So so thanks to OPT, thanks to Space Weather, and uh, from us at uh, at Universe Today. Okay, and then they can they can put that into the show. <laughs> All right, cool. Okay, so okay. let's. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop my recording. I'm doing the same, and I am saving. Also saving. Sorry, everybody. Uh, did you remove the Astronomy Cast Dropbox folder? No. I don't see it. I did not do that, and considering I just saved to it. Oh, okay. I will upload. Maybe I don't have it. I'm not syncing it on this laptop. Oh, that that may be it. That's a difference. Yeah. Okay. Not your problem. Okay. <laughs> that right. is something that you can fix by going to Dropbox.com, which is one yeah. of my favorite things. Yeah, I'll just upload it through, through Dropbox. We receive no money from Google. Well, I don't receive any money from Google or from Dropbox. We simply adore them. Also, we receive I also nothing don't from receive, Oceanside I Photo don't and Telescope. I don't receive any money from Google or Dropbox, <laughs> no. I do get to use their cool studio, so there's that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, today. 
but <laughs> anybody anybody can. I mean, if you have more than ten thousand subscribers on YouTube, you can use the studio. So. I, I, I have to share this as a random. I just had someone tweet me that there's someone named Pam Gay in Pennsylvania who's running for coroner in York County. That is not me. I'm not running for coroner. I do physical sciences, not biological sciences. Those scare me. Vote early. Vote often. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So let's see if we've got some questions from people. And I know some, some questions were, were stacking up, so let me just get to these here. Um... I'm going to go to YouTube first. Um, Michael Jobin says the sun is a globular cluster of hydrogen. I, I totally agree. Um, uh, That's a side joke for those who don't. Yes, know. I say globular cluster, which is which is completely correct. So don't don't. Give me a hard time. Except there was one night when you said globular. Globular. Now you're just making stuff up. All right. Uh, Michael Jobin also says, will the sun's core get denser when the sun dies? Uh, I, that's a confusing question. Um, so the sun, when it ceases to have nuclear reactions in its core, will have its atmosphere float away uh, as mm. a planetary nebula, and the inner parts of the star are going to collapse down into a white dwarf, which is denser, but it's denser in a not as... It, it's, it's just physically different. It's an electron degenerate gas, and because it's compositionally somewhat different, it's not capable of having the nuclear reactions going on. Uh, look, I know that as the sun gets older, and more helium gets built up in its core, the core will increase in size. So will it get less dense? I don't know. Um, a wrong way of looking at it? Yeah. Um, so so the, the core is typically defined as the parts of the star that are undergoing nuclear reactions. So you have the innermost layer, which in the biggest stars might be burning helium, which might be burning silicon instead of hydrogen and helium. You have the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle. There are many different things that can be burning in the center of a star. You can also go through phases where that core isn't actively burning or um, you have shells of material burning instead. It all depends on how you balance the um, density, composition, what's capable of burning altogether, the amount of mass above you. Right. I mean, as you heat up the sun, process. it's going to grow because it's got more energy and it can overpower more of the gravity pulling it in and you can end up with things that are fluffy and I mean it's it's all comes down to those those balancing and forces right the 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 way that that we put it isn't that it's more energy but it the light pressure is greater yeah so if you have greater light pressure fighting against the gravity the gravity's less successful it's able to puff the star out more so this is where at each of the different phase changes in the sun, you might start with an initial contraction. But that contraction is then followed by a reignition of something. And what that something is varies with the state of the sun. Yeah. Um, and that reignition ends up giving off greater light pressure and causing the sun to get larger as it goes through its uh, various red giant phases. Uh, Thomas Traniker says, when I look at pictures of the Great Red Spot on Jupiter, it looks much bigger than on old pictures. Is it shrinking? I think no. it's, it looks much bigger in old pictures. So now it looks smaller than it used to. No, I, I think that's just a difference in technology and zoom size and things like that. But it, I mean, it's not going to last forever. No, no, but our sun hasn't had uh, measurable by photograph size changes over the course of how long cameras have existed. Right. So, so our sun, yeah, it's probably got five billion years left in it. Um, but human history is very small over the course of the solar system. Yeah. We can start to see some of the temperature variations as we look through the geologic history. Um, we can measure minor temperature variations. But it's not the type of thing that our camera technology is yet able to see. 
Uh, Sylvan Westby says, I just managed to do exactly 200 craters in Moon Mapper's Crater Decay awesome. during the recording. Wow. So, so how do people get involved in Moon Mapper's Crater Decay? Uh, you uh, download the Android app, uh, look for uh, Moon Mappers in the Android Play Store, and we will show you image after image after image of craters that have been discovered by people using Moon Mappers online. That's CosmoQuest.org. Click on Science, and Moon Mappers is one of the options. Um, the craters that get found online, you can then uh, help us find the ones of various decay states using the Android app. That is really cool. Uh, Hugo Burnham says, "Any thoughts on the new solar on a new solar minimum?" Now we're just going into solar maximum, and it's starting to behave like a solar maximum. Finally, finally, yeah. Yes, we have a sun. <laughs> um, it's, and it's freaking so, out the way it ought to. Yeah. But it, predicting what the sun is going to do is kind of like predicting the st stock market. You might be right. Yeah. You can have good theories that sound like they should be right, but occasionally, well, both the stock market and the sun have other ideas. Yes. All right. I think that's all the questions I got there. And let me look at one last place. Man, so many places to look for information. I think that's... Uh, Roderick Counts wants to know, when will the U.S. see another solar eclipse? So there just was oh. one. Yeah, there's a big one. I think it's in 2017. Let me double check. It's it's the one that goes through Nashville. Yeah. Like we're this is this is gonna be the big the big one. I mean, we yeah. are gonna all make a big fuss about this. We're all gonna travel. We're gonna. I'm not. Because it's gonna go right past your house, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna uh. drive 30 miles that day. Yeah. So 2017, there's an eclipse path that has the. Um, greatest eclipse, whoa, I just zoomed far too much. It has the greatest eclipse fairly close to where I live. Uh, the greatest eclipse is, is going to be in Kentucky. And what's kind of awesome about this one is it passes uh, just north of Kansas City, just south of St. Louis. Uh, yeah. It's, it's uh, gonna be in well Oregon. south of Charlotte, north of Atlanta. So yeah. it's going near all these major cities. So there's no excuse for people in North America to not use this as an excuse for a vacation. It's August 21, that's oh. summer vacation time, yeah. south of Portland, passing through Idaho, Wyoming, Nebraska, yeah. uh, Kansas, Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, South <laughs> Carolina, just misses North Carolina keeps going off into the ocean and misses all of the cool places to go in the ocean. Um, doesn't quite make it to Africa, which is frustrating. Yeah. But yeah, we have greatest uh, elongation down in Kentucky. And so this is a really neat eclipse path. And um, there's the potential for huge numbers of people to watch this. And there was just another eclipse that was amazingly located. Uh, just over the weekend, there was an eclipse that went through Africa and maybe one of the most watched eclipses in recent times. Yeah, it was even visible from Florida. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, um, and of course the big fake image of the eclipse went around the, the <laughs> yeah, internet again. Yeah, I saw you posting about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we, oh, yeah, we battle this. It, it, some joker every time takes this picture. That's this fic picture of an eclipse from space, and there's like the Milky Way, and there's like a shadow, and it's just, yeah, and it's not real. Um, uh, yeah, so that's August 2017. Like, like. Stick at it, one in your calendars. We will be doing a huge hoopla about this one. Yes, and and we're probably going to send people. To, I know you're planning to go to somewhere uh, west coast ish. Yeah, I think we're thinking Eastern Oregon. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Um, yeah. We're going to stick around here somewhere because heck, I can like drive half an hour oh. and be in a good location. So we'll we'll probably invite all of our friends to yeah. come to my house, and then the day of the eclipse, we'll take off with picnic baskets wherever Sounds the great. weather looks best. We'll figure this out. But this is going to be awesome. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'll come over. This will be great. Yeah, um, be let's see. Anything else? Uh, uh, 
so Tom Nate just jumped in. He said it does the talking about the great red spot that it does change over time. Currently, it's much weaker than in times past, given that it's a 400 plus year old storm. It can't be too surprising that it's waning a bit. So okay, I think I may have misheard the question because I thought it was about the sun. No, no, we were yes. talking about the great red spot on Jupiter. Okay, sorry, I had a brain fart. Okay. Yes, no, the red spot we have seen many changes. The sun we haven't seen many changes. No. So my nonsense reaction was because I heard sun. Um, I think that's it. So I think that's all the questions we've got, and I've got to get back to work now. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, expect to see lots of cool stuff coming out of, uh, out of our work here at the, uh, at the YouTube studios. And, uh, and thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks again, Pamela. We're going to do another live event here on Friday. We're going to be uh, doing the, the Weekly Space Hangout, so uh, hopefully people will be able to join us for that. And, uh, yeah, all right. Well, I hope you recover from your allergies, Pamela. Yes. And thanks, uh, and thanks as always. Sounds good. I'll talk to you later, Fraser. Thanks for uh, joining us from your ever-so-exciting location. <laughs>